do this, why I wanted to like create this presentation. It wasn't forced. And it's a it's a thing that I think about quite quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I, I consider myself a pretty self-motivated person. I have really aggressive goals for myself, personally, career-wise, uh, etc. And so I've really um, been interested in learning more about how I can balance that with also practicing presence of mind, gratitude, etc. And um, a lot of the things that I've read over the years have not done a great job of addressing that synergy between those two different things. Um, so I just kind of want to share what I've figured out so far. Um, this is a compilation of a lot of different things that I've read and experienced, so hopefully it can be helpful for you. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is just kind of an overview of what I call this thing that I try and practice, which is being mindfully ambitious. Um, I'm going to give you guys five different tools that you can use personally to um, kind of incorporate that this into your own life to the degree that it's necessary or helpful. And then we'll do like a 10 minute uh, guided meditation. So that would be pretty fun. Um, so I'm going to ask some questions throughout. Obviously, we'd love for you guys to interact. Uh, first thing I want to ask is for how many of you is it important to excel in your career or in your personal life? or to be a good spouse, like, is it, is it important to you to achieve at a high level? Yeah, what? yeah, me too, I took a gamble that the answer would be yes, so that's good. <laughs> um, how many of you occasionally find yourselves dealing with stress or anxiety or challenges or grappling with some of the things that are a byproduct of that like, desire to succeed? All the time, every every moment, gamble paid off again. I'm glad. Um, and in my mind, that makes perfect sense. Um, everybody in this room is here because of your answer to that first question. Um, you guys all really care about how you achieve things in the professional space. That's why after I picked you, I think that the team has done a fantastic job of bringing in really great people. Um, and that's important because if we're successful at doing what we're attempting to do, which is power a majority of the world's software transactions, that's a pretty major paradigm shift in the market. That's not something that's going to be achieved by people who are like, yeah, it may be cool, but like, it's not that important to me. So um, it doesn't surprise me at all that in the context of this working environment, these are the type of people that we brought together. Um, does anybody know who this guy is? No, but I like his face. Okay. <laughs> his name is Mikhail Prokhorov, and he's a Russian billionaire. He's most known for his part ownership of the New Jersey Nets the basketball team. And I remember seeing a, a 60 Minutes interview of him. This was like late 2000s, early 2010s, um, where he says, I like to be in stress. It's my competitive advantage. And I held on to that for a pretty long time as my like secret sauce. I was like, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm, I'm pursuing these goals kind of frantically and hanging on for dear life, um, and that's what allows me to succeed. If I lose that, I'm going to have a really hard time continuing to achieve at the level that I want to achieve. Uh, so it worked for a little while, but especially during a span of my college years, my load was really crazy. I was working, um, going through uh, you know some stressful times personally, and I just blew a gasket, had a nervous breakdown, um, and so that was that was a bummer. That was not. I was like, all right, I'm gonna have to rethink this. Um, the good news is that I went and saw a therapist, and he really wasn't a therapist. He was more of like a meditation teacher. Uh, and so that started this journey for me, like probably eight years ago when I decided, you know, I'm going to try and get a better strategy in place. Um, ambition is a wonderful tool, but it can be a terrible master if you let it. And that's exactly what happened with me. Um, so what I'm getting at is how can we combine what's evoked by this imagery, which is clarity, peace, space, tranquility with a desire to achieve at a really high level 
which evokes a different type of imagery, which is power and speed and aggression and extraordinary accomplishment. So that's how I got to, to mindful ambition, the practice of maintaining awareness, humility, and gratitude in the pursuit of extraordinary accomplishment. So the five tools are really hearkening back to this theme. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, success. Everybody, of course, has totally different definitions of what it means to be successful, as it should be. Uh, hopefully you guys have your own concepts of what that means. Uh, if you don't, you should write them down. Um, but in our brains, by default, the way that we process success is kind of weird. If we look at a graph of goals over time, and you know, interrupt me if this is not the case for you, I'd be interested to hear. Um, we plot success as a point in the future that once we hit, things kind of get to calm down for a little while. Like, you know, I'll, I'll sell the business, I'll hit the sales goal, I'll get through project X, I'll get this title, whatever it might be for you individually, I'm kind of speaking in professional terms, but maybe it's to get over a health issue or resolve an issue with the spouse. Not uncommon to look at it like this. Um, when the reality is that success, particularly for people that are highly motivated, looks more like this, it's an asymptote. We have a really hard time getting permanently into a state of success because I know I've experienced it. As soon as you reach a goal, the way that your mind works, normally you're gonna recalibrate. And suddenly that point moves and then it moves again Again. And this is true of the most successful people in the world. Very rarely do you hear from people who are like, no, I'm good. It's a, it's a wrap on my success and I'm just going <laughs> to hang out from here. Um, and yeah, your answer to that first question I asked you really, I think, validates that. That you guys are trying to achieve at high level, so are most everybody in this building. And so this is always going to be moving for you. Um, I, I, I doubt if for a very long period of time, there will surely be temporary periods where it sits still for a little while, um, but it's for the most part going to continue moving. Uh, there's a lot of ways to talk about like practicing uh, enjoyment along the way. It's about the journey, enjoy the process, be happy now are all different ways. Um, there's a, this guy named Earl Nightingale who's like one of the fathers of modern self-development. And he said, success is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. So a worthy goal is something that's not gonna harm yourself or others. You know, if you're like trying to be the number one crack dealer in San Francisco, that probably doesn't <laughs> constitute a worthy goal. Um, but what's most important is progressive realization. So if you are moving towards that goal, that means you're successful, period. You're already there. And that's, really hard to digest just being self-motivated people, goal-driven people, because it's like, no, the goal is really the thing. Um, but in fact, it's, it's really not. And you hear this over and over and over again. I read, I read a lot of biographies. I don't know if you guys like that type of narrative, but very commonly people are like, man, I was having so much fun. Like, I wish I just would have calmed down a little bit along the way. So, First exercise related to redefining success that I want to give to you guys is taking a success inventory or a self-appreciation inventory. This is really hard to do by yourself, believe it or not, because if you're self-motivated, you're going to get back into the old mental pattern of like, well, actually, I haven't done anything yet. Like, I'm still trying to get to do the things that I want to do. So what I would recommend is you find a loved one, a friend, a coworker if you're comfortable with that, take them out to lunch and tell them to outline why they think you're successful. That's a really personal conversation. It'll probably help if you like buy lunch or you know, a couple <laughs> drinks, um, depending on how many friends you have. Uh, and, and then obviously return the favor and, and listen to what you hear. It's kind of like having a conversation with your grandmother. Like, you know, if I told my grandmother, like, hey, grandma, remember when I graduated high school? She'd be like, yeah. Awesome, but obviously that's so far in my rear view, I don't even think about that anymore, right? Um, so that's a, the that's a first thing, I would really encourage you to do that. Uh, second thing I wanna talk about is, is practicing gratitude. This is like a very buzzy term, but hopefully we can kind of get down to what, what the, the root of it is. Uh, does anybody recognize this guy? 
Bingo. So this is painted by Paul De La Roche. This is Napoleon at Fontainebleau. This is when he signed the treaty that submitted his empire to the other powers of Europe. They were dissolving Napoleon's empire. And you know it was a very uh, dramatic rise and, and fall. Um, but look at that face. I mean, I've been there before, right? And if only there was a time, you know, two years earlier, three years earlier, that Napoleon would have been like, you know what, I'm good. But he wanted, he wanted to eat the world, right? He wanted, you know, it was going to be the Napoleon universe. That was his, that was his goal. And had he found a way to sit down and look at, you know, his obviously his possessions or his power or his influence and taking a moment to recognize how much he had to be grateful for, you know, maybe he wouldn't have A, been such an asshole and B, not ended up like this um, before, before being exiled. Um, you guys definitely want to know who this guy is. He's a subject of a documentary called Happy, which I recommend you guys all watch. His name is Manaj Singh, and he lives in the Calcutta slums in India, and he is like super happy. He cites several things in his life that he's really appreciative on a daily basis. So we'll look at this. House. It's like, I love my house. It doesn't have any walls, but that's cool because I get all this fresh air in and out so like it doesn't get too hot. And I love my neighbors. Like, we live on top of each other, but when I come home, we laugh and we share space and that's really positive for me. Um, he likes his job. He drives a rickshaw. And he even cites the fact that, you know, sometimes there's like these crazy torrential downpours, but I know even when, you know, and he's wearing like sandals, I know that the next ride I get, when it dries off, I'm gonna run and my clothes will dry. So it's not that big a deal. Um, and then obviously he, he, loves his, he loves his kids. It's kind of a universal uh, theme of gratitude, being grateful for your children, but we so seldom can apply that to other areas of our life. Um, and uh, you know, you got miserable Napoleon and you know, happy Minaj. He, he looks like he's in pretty good shape. I don't have a where is Minaj now update, but uh, <laughs> at the time of filming, he seemed like a pretty happy guy. Uh, so a really common way to, to practice gratitude is to keep a gratitude journal. So I have a couple entries of, of my own. This stuff boils down to the most trivial stuff. You will be shocked at how boring the most exciting parts of your life and your day are when you go back and review these. I'm like, say flight, my employee arrived on time. That was a big deal. Uh, <laughs> I had a good book. Uh, 2014, that day I was feeling really good about the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to go out and fight it out, even though it was a, you know, a, a clawing battle. Uh, Ashley being a good partner to me, supporting me, even though I was probably a total pain, I was Napoleon. Um, my health, I, have, I had a buddy who uh, came down with ulcerative colitis out of nowhere and uh, totally changed his life. He's, he's fine now, it's in, it's in remission just about, but I was like, Whoa, this is so weird. Like, that, that could be me. There's no, nothing different. I grew up in the same town as I've known my whole life since we were kids. And uh, so at that moment, I was feeling really strongly uh, appreciative of my health. Um, uh, this is more recently. I, I, I'm part of a reading group, and one of my buddies gave me a great pep talk. Recently, I, I don't even know what it was about. <laughs> uh, productive meditation session, even though I took some time off. And uh, I went to a startup festival, the launch festival. I talked to some of you guys about that, and I just was like really motivated, feeling really charged after that. Um, it's never the like, I hit the sales goal, I closed the deal, I, I pushed to production. It, it's so rarely those things. It's these very diminutive daily experiences that show up here. Um, there's a book called Motivation Manifesto written by Brendan Burchard, which I'll recommend to you guys. Um, and he calls it being joyous masters. So every day practicing the habit of, even if you're not moving the ball that far downfield, being grateful, being joyful about just doing it, just the practice of doing it. You can start seeing consistency here between redefining success. Uh, so three things. Um, 
It's actually one exercise. Three things, write down three things you're grateful for. Try it for like five days. Go back and look at it. A lot of this stuff is about writing things down. You know, taking the time to extract what's in your mind and put it down on paper. Um, third thing I want to talk about is maintaining perspective, which is a, a, a very challenging thing to do. Does anybody recognize this photo? Pale Blue Dot. Pale Blue Dot. So in 1980, they launched Voyager 1, which was designed to go to the deepest, deepest depths of space to collect data on our universe. Um, and in 1985, just about the time it was gonna go beyond where we were gonna get like a pretty healthy data exchange, I think it was out somewhere near Saturn or getting close to it, Carl Sagan, who was the originator of the Cosmos series, one of the most famous astronomers and astrophysicists, um, was like, hey, take a picture of Earth. And I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> We're not really going to see anything. He's like, yeah, we'll give it a try. We'll calibrate it. It took him five years to figure out how to do it. And then in 1990, they got it. That's Earth. Um, so that means it's you. It's your family. It's your friends. It's your emotions, your spirituality, your career, your successes, and your failures right there on a pale blue dot. And not just you. Everybody ever in the history of mankind, right? has originated, lived, and died on this speck. And Sagan uh, wrote up failures too. I almost forgot those. Um, he said it pretty, pretty fantastically, on a mote of dust suspended, suspended on a sunbeam. So uh, a great way to kind of ground yourself. You know, we inflate our internal struggles and problems and things like that. Uh, and you know, looking at an image like that can be really helpful. Uh, another story I'll share with you is in the 1990s, there was a group of uh, archaeologists that found a tomb. I want to say it was like in Turkey or somewhere in the Mediterranean. Um, and basically discovered that there was this group of individuals, like I think it was like a dozen or something, who were clearly people of wealth and influence. They had all the trappings of uh, trappings of a you know wealthy person, the clothing and the, all the stuff that people used to bury themselves with when they were rich to get a, a good shake in the afterlife. And they couldn't figure out how these people were. With modern tools, you know, we can find new dinosaurs, but we had no way to pinpoint who these seemingly influential people were. Like, you know. Maybe one of you will be buried in a tomb surrounded by gold and wealth and uh, you know nice threads and things like that. Reality is, three or four hundred years out, nobody's gonna be able to figure out who you are. Like your LinkedIn profile is gonna be long gone. <laughs> nobody's gonna care, right? Um, Charles de Gaulle said the graveyards are full of indispensable men. We all go the same way. For some people, that's a really morbid thought. For me, I find it pretty liberating. Because uh, it's like, yeah, what, what, you know, Steve Jobs did a commencement speech where he cited this, you know, no better way to figure out you have nothing to lose than being fatally ill. Um, uh, Alanda Baton, I'm going to recommend one of his books, says, uh, Judge Against Eternity, how little of what agitates us makes any difference. Very true. It's really important to maintain perspective. Uh, third exercise I want to give you guys is to go out into nature. This tends to be the best way to do it. Leave your phone in your car. Ideally, go by yourself. You don't need to Snapchat it. You don't need to Instagram it. People can figure out later that you went to the beach. But go sit on the sand. Do it earlier in the morning when nobody's there if you can. Uh, there was a great segment of Adi's career video where they showed him in Armstrong Woods. That will ground you. Looking at these trees that have been around for thousands of years. You know, we, we can't go where Voyager is, unfortunately. So that's a hard experience to, to replicate. But um, you know, take two or three hours. Don't don't uh, don't go to exercise, right? Like a lot of people in this office hike, but it's like get one hour in and then brunch and you know. So <laughs> try and try and not characterize it as a strictly productive task. Um, number four, wealth columns. Um, by the way, if you guys want to interrupt me at any point of this, please, please do. Uh, we live in a meritocracy. Um, which is eternally fair, right? It's a system that's built 
so that the people who accomplish the most you get the biggest rewards, right? So if you, in your, in your professional career, uh, giving back to the community, you are going to reap the rewards of fame, financial wealth, whatever it might be. Um, this is a totally new concept, by the way, in, in, in the context of civilized humanity. Um, this is like a Google search of the use of the term from 1800 to 2010. Um, a couple hundred years ago, this was not how things were organized. Um, in fact, it was um, much easier to be happy because we didn't have so much upward mobility. Basically, you had royalty, you had clergy, and you had peasants and everybody else. And people were really pleased being part of that group because it was not a meritocracy. It wasn't like, man, I'm going to plow the shit out of this field and I'm going to be royalty. Unfortunately, not how it works. Um, so like I said, eternally fair, but what's interesting about this is we've created this culture of mythologizing accomplishment. And we're getting a little bit better at associating this with things other than financial achievement. Um, anybody like buy this magazine, 30 and 30? I used to. I don't anymore because it drove me up the wall. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, more why. If, if you're not under 30, no problem. They've got a 40 under 40. If you're not under 40, no problem. You just get to upgrade to the richest people in the universe list. Hanging out with Oprah and you know Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Um, so as I was saying, when, when society was organized a little bit differently where you were just part of a single group, it was easier to be at peace because upward mobility was not something that was expected of you. But now, when accomplishment is available to everybody, it's really hard to ever feel like you're done. To be like, yes, I'm successful. Well, take a walk to the airport, check out 30 under 30, no you're not, you're not doing anything cool. So, um, it's an easy trap to fall into, right? Um, if we live among people the same height, we will not be unduly troubled by our size. But if others in our group grow just a little taller than us, we're gripped by dissatisfaction and envy. And that's why those types of magazines are, can, can churn up uh, emotions, at least for somebody like me, uh, because we associate ourselves in those groups. I'm under 30. Like, I didn't have any tough upbringing. Why am I not on that list? I'm under 40. I'm a person. Why am I not the richest person on earth, right? We're in a meritocracy. Like, what am I missing? This is the same type of anxiety that arises around like high school reunions. You know, you like get the gym membership before you go, so everybody knows you can still, you know, throw football or cheerlead or whatever. Um, what we what we forget is that the most important things in our lives are actually spread around a lot of different categories. And I said they're getting a little bit better at um, acknowledging people in social entrepreneurship or in other areas. Uh, but for the most part, you know, the, the people that rise to the top are achieving pretty great things financially. That's just the, that's just the unfortunate reality of the meritocracy. That's our measurement. How much money are you making, right? Um, but there are a lot more important things in our finances. Body, emotions, relationships, career, spirituality, time. These are all things that make up the fabric of our, our lives. So if we go back to one of these magazine covers, what's really easy to do is go, bam, Marissa Mayer is crushing it, right? She's on the cover of Fortune magazine. Like, right? She's amazing. She's clearly like she's in great shape. She looks stoic but you know strong. <laughs> uh, probably has good relationships. Her finances and her career are obviously in good shape. Uh, she's a smart person. She's probably practicing you know spirituality and and I mean she's CEO of the company. She can do whatever she wants. Her time is fine. Realistically, we we have no idea about any of these things. And unfortunately for Marissa, she's had a tough last couple of years. Um, you know, you could point to finances, maybe she's, she's loaded, maybe not, maybe her Yahoo wealth is in stock and, and uh, we all know how that's doing lately. Um, so it, it's really important to take a moment to recognize how you stack up in all these columns. We can sometimes, in a, merito in a meritocracy, focus on finances and professional achievement being the most important thing. There are other columns. Uh, fourth exercise I want to give you guys related to uh, uh, wealth columns is sitting down and plotting yours out. It seems so arbitrary, but uh, just taking the time to think about our wealth in other areas, again, I'll use the story about my friend again. 
but before that, I might have been like, you know, I'm not bench pressing or squatting what I want, so health is like down here. And then hearing from him, and he just got thrown in a hole, and I'm like, yeah, maybe I would, I would reevaluate that. Uh, a lot of things we take for granted in our wealth columns. Um, last thing I want to talk about, thank you guys for your patience, uh, is, is mindfulness and specifically meditation. So uh, I asked a few of you if you, if you had an active practice, and it doesn't sound like anybody does, so that's, that's cool. Um, great, great time to start, but it is very confusing to breach this field of discussion. If you, I did it yesterday, Google meditation, you know, articles like 108 different types of meditation, 12 types of meditation, uh, there's Zen meditation, transcendental meditation, chakra meditation, yoga, vipassana, mantra meditation. Uh, there are different religious factions that have philosophies on how to meditate. Um, the best description I've read so far is just this simple idea of monkey mind versus lion mind. Um, so, what, what kind of like, what are the words that come to mind when you look at this little guy? <laughs> What's that? Childish. Childish, okay. Mischief. Mischievous, okay. Nervous. Nervous? I don't want to say something, I don't know how to say it. He's kind of like, kind of curious, yeah, like, what's over there? Kind of like checking out, hanging on. Oh, this guy. I will eat you. Yeah. Confident, right? Like, I make my decisions, I execute, okay? Um, this is ultimately what we're getting at in meditation is monkey mind is the little curious guy who's kind of nervous and hanging on and is going to grasp at every shiny object he can get his hand on, right? And so our minds will bounce from one thing to the next very quickly. Um, and it, we find it hard to focus. Meditation is designed to start like entering your own mind, journeying within to observe that monkey mind and start to quiet it down into creating a mind that's much more calm, confident, focused. And when you first start meditating, it is really, really hard. And then it gets a little bit easier and a little bit easier. And what's great is soon, this lion mind starts exiting your meditation practice and coming into your daily life. So instead of just your meditation being the time that you're most at peace or most calm, it's, it, it's, it extends into your morning or to your afternoon. And, and you get to this place where you're not that nervous guy who's you know, just grappling with daily stuff that really uh, doesn't matter. Blase Pascal says, all men's mi miseries derive from not being able to sit alone in a quiet room or in a quiet room alone. So true, especially now. Like, these things, man. Nobody just sits down and spaces out anymore. You know, it just does not happen. So meditation can be a great way to start uh, recapturing that time. Um, so I would challenge you guys to start a practice. If you have not, we'll do a quick run through um, in just a minute here. There are a lot of tools available now that make it really easy for you to start. And so if you're not challenged with any of this stuff, great. Like, come talk to me. I want to figure out how you're doing it. Yeah, I, I'd love to learn from you. Um, Think or note about meditation, it is, it is the easiest thing to shed from your schedule. Not practicing meditation for 10 minutes in the morning is like, I, I can live without it, right? Because you've lived without it for however many years you've been on the planet, potentially. Um, you need to be intense about meditation. It's the same thing as a workout routine, a diet, being a good spouse, taking care of your kids. You really need to prioritize it for it to be useful. And, and habitual, that's a really important part here. If you meditate once a month, probably not gonna do anything for you. Uh, so as the, as the last thing I'm gonna you know, challenge you guys to do, I would say to, to start practice, come talk to me if you want more input on how to do that. Um, what's cool about all these categories, after I put these together, I realized you sound pretty familiar in the context of after it. A lot of these things apply to our existing values, right? True North is all about understanding where we're going long term, having a grounded understanding of where we're trying to get, not just grasping at that next threshold, right? PMA, to be grateful, you have to be positive. There's no other way to do it. Uh, maintaining perspective is all about humility.